Hi guys, on well, my next video I'm going to start reading a book. I'm going to read chapter one today, um, but before we start I thought it might be nice to have a look at the vocabulary that's contained in the chapter because it is uh, set in the Viking times and some of the words are a little bit unfamiliar to us and it might help us to understand the story a bit better if we know what they mean. If I keep disappearing, it's because I need to press the button on my laptop, which is down there, because the leads aren't long enough to reach. Um, but we'll, we'll work through it. Okay, so a steading. A steading is a Viking settlement, a farm, its buildings, which contain probably some servants, uh, the children and the family. A half. A hearth is a fireplace in the home where the cooking is done and it, it provides warmth uh, through the winter months because Vikings had very long winters and being a lot further north than we are, the nights are darker for longer and it gets very cold. A longhouse, a uh, traditional, um, probably a wealthy Viking warrior family or farm would live in a longhouse and it was made of wooden beams with mud walls uh, and a thatched roof. A thatched roof is just like dried grass. Runes. Uh, runes are the Viking form of writing, um, an alphabet system. If you look here you could actually probably work out how to write your name in the runes and maybe that's an activity we could do at some point. Um, but runes were had symbolic um, messages as well. So Vikings would use runes to uh, either write down curses or write down messages to um, or make things stronger or to bless things in, in want of another word. A Jarl. A Jarl is a Viking chief or leader um, and they'd be in charge of either a village or a, what we might call a town or a settlement um, and Jarls were usually the, the greatest warriors because in Viking times you'd probably have to fight your way to the top. Chainmail. A chainmail is a type of armour and that's made up of small metal rings, all linked together. Almost like uh, metal knitting, really. And that would go over the top, like a tunic, and probably in the helmet as well, just to protect the wearer going into battle. Um, the sword. Okay, um, in chapter one, we get to see um, a, a, a sword, or get to meet a sword that um, is used by one of the characters and um, it mentions some of the words that are to do with the sword like we've got here actually there's a diagram parts of the sword we've got the pommel now the pommel is at the top it's quite an important um, bit of the sword it's uh, it helps balance the sword when you're using it but also it can be used to um, bang in people's faces or on people's heads as well it was an important part of the weapon as well as the blade. So, and then we've got the hilt. Now this is the hilt, the whole top of the um, sword where it's held. So with the handle. And uh, you've got the handle, the grip, including the pommel, and then you've got the guard, which is like the cross. So if, if swords were trying to clash and the swords came down to the bottom, then the guard will stop the sword coming down and chopping your hand off. And that wouldn't be very good, would it? No. Uh, the hilt, um, again, is all that. The scabbard is um, the, the protective covering, if you will, um, that is worn on the belt of the Viking that the sword slides into, usually lined with um, sheep wool um, to protect the metal and also keep it from getting rusty. And the blade obviously is a big long metal bit that's very very sharp, it's got the two edges and can slice through 
um, skin and bone and everything. I don't think I'd be liking to do that myself really. Okay, so I think we're about ready to um, read chapter one. So I'll see you in the Viking longhouse. Hi guys, let me take you back to Viking times. I'm going to be reading a book called Viking Boy by Tony Bradman. Chapter one, men's work. Gunnar was down by the sheep pens when he heard the rhythmic thumping of hoof beats and the jingle of harness and weapons sounding distantly through the crisp autumn air. He frowned and looked up along the track that led from the Settings gate to the dark forest, then turned and ran to the longhouse. His parents were sitting together on the bench by the hearth, smoke from the fire rising to the hole in the thatch. A pot hung above the flames, and the smells of wood smoke and stew wrapped themselves around him like the furs he slept beneath at night. They were laughing, and mother was ladling stew into bowls. Everybody said Gunnar and his father were alike, like two ears of corn, although Gunnar didn't, couldn't see it. They both had shaggy brown hair, but father's hair and beard were flecked with grey. They both had hazel eyes, but Gunnar's were darker, and they both had strong features and broad shoulders, but father was tall, and even at 15 summers, Gunnar was still half a head shorter. Mother's hair was golden, and father's said her eyes were the colour of the sea, changing from blue to green to grey according to the light or her mood. Ah, here's our boy, just in time for supper as usual, said father, grinning at him. Like Gunnar, he was wearing a tunic and leggings and leather boots. Mother wore a green gown and a silver necklace, and she smiled too. I swear you could smell my stew from the other side of the mountains, she said. Riders in the forest, Guna said breathlessly, heading this way. Father stood up, his smile gone. Mother's face clouded over. How many, said father, his voice steady, eyes fixed on his sons. Hard to say, Guna answered, six, maybe seven at most. Who could it be, said mother, her hand on her husband's arm. Well, we'll know when they get here, said father. It's probably nothing, but we'd better make sure there's a proper welcome, just in case. Ranulf, Anor, he shouted. Two men appeared from the shadows. Get your hunting spears and tell the others to do the same. Gunnar, fetch my sword. Gunnar ran to his parents' curtained off chamber and raised the lid of the chest that stood at the end of their bed. It contained many things, clothes and furs, the best bowls and goblets, but lying on top was the sword. Father had used his young Viking. It was in a wooden scabbard lined inside with sheep's fleece. The oily wool kept the metal free from rust. An ivory hilt bound with aged darkened leather was topped off by a round pommel inlaid with gold and silver. The blade had a shallow groove running from the hilt to tip and it was razor sharp on both edges. Now Gunnar lifted the sword and scabbard from the chest, partially pulled the blade free and then held it up so the glow from the hearth could, be, could fall on it. Faint lines twisted and writhed in the metal, almost as if the sword were alive and the red firelight brought back memories of the day that had been born in some ancient forge's heat. Runes were carved on the blade, a cluster of spiky letters that spelled the word's name. He pushed the blade back into the scabbard and hurried outside. A crowd had gathered, the people of the farm coming out to see who the visitors might be. Gunnar made his way through them, the men talking in hushed voices, the women clutching their children, everyone uneasy, but curious as well. Father was waiting with his men in front of the longhouse, mother by his side. Gunnar handed him the sword and father buckled it on. It's time you went indoors now, Helga father said softly, and best take the boy with you. This will be men's work. 
All the more reason for a woman to keep an eye on you, snapped Mother. But you better do as your father says, Guna. No, I won't, muttered Guna. If you're staying, I'm staying too. Would you listen to the pair of them, said Father, rolling his eyes. Maybe someday I'll find out what it's like to be obeyed by my family. The men around him laughed nervously. <laughs> Ranulf was staring wide-eyed at the gate, holding the shaft of his hunting spear as if he would never let it go. His knuckles, white, stout, balding Anor stood beside him, chewing his lip. Here they come, Ranulf whispered. They're in full war, war gear. I can see that for myself, Ranulf said father. Gunnar noticed him touching the small amulet of Thor he wore on a leather thong around his neck. The riders thundered through the gateway and up to the longhouse, seven men on powerful snorting horses. They seemed enormous in the fading light, the setting sun's rays glinting off their weapons, their shadows reaching out before them. They wore chainmail and helmets with holes for their eyes and carried spears and round shields, swords hung from their studded belts. I bid you welcome to my farm, Scully, son of Ejof, his father said, when the riders halted. But I wonder why you're so far from home on this chill autumn evening, and why you're armed for war. If it's bad news you've got, then I'd rather you stepped into the warmth of my hall and told me over supper. You've got a good memory, Bjorn, son of Sigurd, said the leading warrior, jumping off his horse. He removed the helmet and smiled, his teeth white in a bushy black beard. We met only once, and that was two years ago. How could I ever forget his face as ugly as yours? Said father, smiling too. You're calling me ugly, said Scully. I'd like to know how a man as ugly as you could have persuaded such a beauty to be his wife. Ah, so this is Helga. Scully cast his eyes over Mother, grinning at her, before turning his gaze back to Father. There was a ripple of muttering in the crowd by the longhouse, but Gunnar knew this was the sort of banter men liked to indulge in. I took pity of him, of course. Daft girl that I was, said Mother. Now if you two boys would care to stop playing games, I'd like to go inside and eat. Wit as well as beauty, eh, said Scully, laughing. As it happens, I do have some news for you, Bjorn, and we'd be happy to accept your hospitality. The two men shook hands in the Viking way, gripping each other's forearms, and they went in. Much to everyone's relief, Scully and his men leaving their weapons stacked in the porch as guests should. Mother had the long tables put out and food and drink prepared, and soon the horse hall was filled with voices and laughter, flames leaping in the hearth. Guna sat near Father and Scully and listened as they talked about many things, including, at last, Scully's news. There's word a band of raiders sniffing around, he said, so I thought I ought to show myself and warn the local farmers, of course. You have a fine holding. I would hate to see it looted and burned by a bunch of outlaws. That's good of you, said Father. Gunnar remembered they'd heard plenty of talk about Scully recently. Their guest was a man with ambitions. He owned several farms and some said he had 50 warriors at his beck and call. Some also said he had his mind set on becoming a Jarl, perhaps even a king. Well, you know how it is, my friend, said Scully. I'd like people to think I'm a man who will help them, just in case I need help myself someday. Help to do what? said Father, his eyes fixed on Scully's, a slight frown on his face. You're the richest and most powerful man in the district. And you're the most respected. Who knows what I couldn't do with a man like you by my side? Don't you want power and wealth too? Father smiled at him and shook his head. I'm happy enough with what I have, and I want no more. I like a quiet life these days. Are you sure, said Scully, leaning forward. I'd hate to think you might oppose me in what I aim to do, beyond Sidgardson. 
Oh, you have nothing to fear from me, said Father, his voice steady. So then, he went on, what else can you tell me about these raiders? Scully paused, studying Father's face, or so it seemed to Gunnar. At last, Scully smiled. Not much more in truth, he said. Well, thanks for the warning, said Father. We'll post guards from now on. You can never be too careful. The conversation moved on, Scully boasting about great warriors he had known and battles he had fought in. Father said little. Later, as Gunnar lay down to sleep, he went over to Scully's, he went over Scully's stories in his mind, wondering if he would ever stand shoulder to shoulder with a band of warriors when he was a man. In the forest, wolves howled and shadows gathered in the darkness. End of chapter one.